I'm here in Corvallis, Oregon with Peter Ballasted, uh, a forage agronomist, Yes, I think. Oh, I got that right. Well done. <laughs> Excellent. And you have, uh, well, you're involved in the whole forage feeding of animals, all the science around that, and you have your own website and blog where you talk about this, so maybe give some of those details. Sure. <laughs> um, thank you for having me. Uh, I have been writing since 2010, grass-based health uh, in various places on the web and speaking around the country and in some other countries. Mm. Um, basically advocating for the low-carb, high-fat dietary approach mm. and also advocating for ruminant agriculture. Absolutely, and the place that ruminant agriculture can have in our modern world that can improve people's health and uh, also improve possibly ecology in that. Mm -hmm. um, actually, one thing that occurs to me now is, and you've been talking to me last year about it, people will be aware that omega-3, omega-6, you should have a correct ratio. And there's talk that grass-fed animals have a better ratio of omega-3 to omega-6 essential oils. But that may not be, it may not be that much healthier than standard cattle, uh, the grass-based. Maybe you talk a bit about that. Sure. Mm. Um, I think that we've been suffering from a very long running narrative that said that eating animals, animal products was bad and mm. wrong. Um, and what we've confronted is that people like eating animal products. Mm. And so we'd like to not feel guilty about it. So we try to find something that makes us feel less guilty about enjoying the animal products. Mm. Uh, there are undoubtedly and undeniably differences in animal products that come from different management practices. Mm. The question that hasn't been answered is the biological significance of those differences. Right. And people will make very various claims that when I've tried to investigate them, I haven't been convinced. Mm. So there are various th levels that have been set by various uh, health experts. Uh, I think the uh, Harvard School of Public Health set a four to one ratio mm. as desirable mm. for omega-6 to omega-3. Um, the issue though gets to is it quantity mm. or ratio? Yes, of course. And mm. we can see that there are these differences. There are several problems though with those figures because they vary tremendously between breeds and time of year mm. and the muscle that you're taking and, and all mm. of those differences can make those ratios vary quite significantly. Right. Yeah. But quantitatively, there's not large amounts. So if you were going to try to get um, the same amount of omega-3, for example, that from uh, grass-fed beef as you could get from an ounce of cooked wild-caught salmon, you would have to be eating something like three pounds Oh, wow. of cooked ground grass-fed beef hmm. and so then you're left well how important is that and if you're still eating vegetable oils then it's unimportant because yes. you're getting such a massive dose of omega-6 from those vegetable oils and and I think the figures are something like you'd have to eat two pounds of salmon to get enough omega-3 to counteract the omega-6 that you'd get from two tablespoons of safflower oil. Yes, so uh, the, the absolute values, and I know you showed a graph that basically, you know, the absolute amount of omega-6 in grass-fed versus, um, I don't know, feedlot, you know, and you've got these tiny bars on the graph for the amounts of omega-3, omega-6, and then for a similar quantity of food from safflower oil, you had this huge bar. Mm. I mean, the scale was enormous. Mm -hmm. So really the absolute amounts are very low, so the ratio doesn't count so much. That's essentially the thing. It, it, it mm. would seem that way to me. Yeah, and, and from your data, I, I'd agree, just from mm. looking at your 
mm. actual data. Yeah. And and if people are you know wanting that four to one ratio, then and that's fine. I'm all for oh, people yeah. who are producing grass fed meat from animal ruminant animals. But if if a consumer is saying that's what they must have, the tricky thing then is that they shouldn't be eating pork or poultry mm. because it has a higher omega-6 to omega-3 ratio than even the you know commercial feed lock. feed grain finished beef yeah, yeah. and and there's abundant research even showing that we can grain finish beef and have um, a omega-6 to omega-3 ratio that's much closer to four to one Hmm. And so these these things aren't as hard and fast as many people yeah. say. And and I'm I have no qualms about eating poultry and pork. By the way, it's just oh. that for that sort of consistency, um, mm. that's one of the benefits of a ruminant animal, is that they're always going to have a lower level of polyunsaturated fatty acids in the meat. Mm. than will poultry or swine because mm. of the digestive system. Right, and again, these are essentials, the omega-3, omega-6, but traditionally we would have had very low amounts of them in our diet. Mm. So, as you say, the cattle are, have the low amounts that you probably should have, not particularly high amounts, and much lower than pork and chicken, which people perceive as fine. Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's, it's, it's something I might just attach to this um, you know, on the web, I'll just attach those, I think just those two graphs that mm. you had, the bar charts, mm -hmm. that really eloquently shows what you're, what you're saying. Um, another thing is the idea that, that cattle uh, in general and ruminants, that the, in terms of saving the world and ecology and, and all this, that it's better for the world for us to eat vegetable products and that cattle and cows are bad for the planet. Mm. Um, I've seen a lot of information, good science recently, that calls that into question hugely. Mm -hmm. um, and I've seen some guy, you probably know his name in South Africa, who's talking mm -hmm. about if we replaced ruminants onto the land, we'd improve the ecology mm -hmm. through a natural cycle. So maybe you talk a bit about mm -hmm. that, the myth of cattle being bad for mm -hmm. global warming. Mm -hmm. Well, the grasslands of the world are the largest biome. Mm. and on, on dry land and grasslands developed with grazing animals yeah. and fire as the primary drivers and, and factors within those systems. Mm. If you remove fire, if you remove grazing animals, then in some of the fringe areas where maybe higher rainfall you'll start to see woody species encroach where mm. previously it had been dominated by grass. And so we know that by manipulating grazing management, we can shift the species that are present. Mm. Uh, and there's been a great deal of work showing the benefits of improved grazing management in all kinds of environments. Mm. The simple fact is that the vast majority of the Earth's land surface is incapable of producing food crops that humans can utilize directly. Yes. And so most of the Earth's surface is producing a substance, basically cellulose, and humans and all other mammals can't digest cellulose. We don't produce that enzyme cellulase. Mm. It's the microbes that produce cellulase. And ruminants have these large fermentation vats. Yeah, uh, inside. The, the first two stomachs, essentially, mm. uh, of their four stomach system. And so they house that microbial population that ferments the vegetative material that they ingest. Mm. They eat this high fiber, low fat material that humans can't utilize. Mm. They ingest all manner of nitrogen containing compounds and they produce from that high quality animal fat and high quality animal protein that we need as human beings. Mm. And, and so it's this wonderful ecological function that allows us to exist over such a wide part of the Earth's mm. surface. 
and evolve indeed i mean there's a any most paleoanthropologists would acknowledge that we evolved to the energy density and nutrient density of animal foods or indeed fish uh, and that's how our massive brain developed um, so it's ironic now to kind of turn that on its head <laughs> so to speak, yes. <laughs> Literally. Uh, <laughs> in, indeed, um, somebody, you know, we are by nature meat-eating cooks. Yes, and cooking, of course, very important too in, in the evolution, yeah. And various other forms of processing mm. to, to uh, increase the energy content of our diet. Mm. Um, and, and now we obviously don't have to be tied to food production we mm. we, we can uh, expend our efforts in in other areas the question of course then is what is the nature of the diet that we should be following mm. as i said i i happen to be very happy advocating a low carbohydrate high fat diet for anyone who manifests symptoms of metabolic syndrome i think that that's a logical first step in, in your mm. treatment, and uh, certainly my personal experience. Um, the argument that then comes back is, well, can we feed the world this way? Yes. Um, uh, can people afford to eat this way? And then, as we just discussed, this idea that it, it will destroy the planet by doing this. Mm. And, and I think briefly the answer to, hmm. you know, we can feed the world this way. Uh, number two, there's wonderful examples. Ted Noakes, uh, sorry, Tim Noakes hmm. Foundation in South Africa extending this dietary information to the population in South Africa. Hmm. If you can do it there, you can do it in many, many other places as well. Hmm. And, and then I'm convinced that just as we were told that a plant-based diet was a healthier diet and and that message started back in the 60s and the 70s yeah. and ultimately uh, resulted in the dietary guidelines in 1980 these other stories are, are part of that same narrative mm. and I think that when you unpack if you can dig into the stories a little bit you can find there's a different story Mm. Um, so, for example, many people will say it takes 10 pounds of feed to make a pound of beef, mm. and therefore we should just eat those 10 pounds to begin with. Mm. Well, what they don't tell you, perhaps what they don't realize themselves, is that that's the total ration, and that's an old figure. It's, it's more efficient now. Mm. It, it takes less than 10 pounds of a total ration, but once upon a time it did. Mm. Well, but that's the total ration, and even an animal in the feedlot at the final stages of feeding, when the energy level is at its highest, is still getting at least a quarter of its feed from forage, which we just discussed is, isn't usable by humans. Mm. And then a significant amount of the rest isn't human utilizable either. Mm. And, and so when you dig into that bit that is human utilizable, you find that these animals are actually multiplying the food supply for humans. They mm. don't represent competition. Mm. And that would be just one quick example of, of how the story, when you dig into it, isn't quite what it's been portrayed. Mm. And of course, the animals, the way I view it simplistically, they convert material, which is of little use to us, into the highest nutrient density with all of the, the, or the attributes or the elements that we need for, for health. Mm -hmm. They convert it almost magically into mm -hmm. what we really need, mm -hmm. uh, which is superb. Um, but then the, the whole methane thing or the idea that if we have plenty of animals to feed us for, for the current population and we well managed, you know, the grasslands properly, um, the idea of releasing methane, I believe that's also kind of a myth. There, there's, there's a lot, again, there's, there's more mm. stories, uh, but basically the, any carbon that an animal is going to emit came from the atmosphere in the first place. Mm. And, and many times the whole conversation about emissions only looks at 
the emission side, not yeah. the supply side. Mm. And, and so there's been some work done very recently, measurement of soil organic carbon or soil carbon mm. uh, changes um, in the southeastern U.S. And the rate of increase is frankly higher than we thought possible up previously under well-managed dairy pasture management. Mm. And the amount of carbon that's getting fixed is enormous compared to other industrial sources of emissions. Um, and, and so, uh, again, I think we've had an oversimplified story. Um, one of the aspects of this would be um, by improving the efficiency of the animals that we have, we would get more production with lower methane emissions. Hmm. And, and so one thing that we could do is extend our current management practices throughout a wider part of the world hmm. and make those animals more productive. Right, more efficient, so less exactly. releases per Exactly. Per kilogram of high nutrient density, good food. Exactly. Mm. And, and then if one wanted to take a bigger look at sustainability, one could begin to say, well, what sorts of impacts, what's the societal component? Mm. What's the economic component? What's the ecological component? And, and really, you need to look at all three of those. Yeah. Um, there's no such thing as um, a, a benefit without cost. Mm. There's, there's, there's always some kind of minus that goes along. Yeah. And let's start to look at the cost of chronic illness in society. Mm. What's the burden of the chronic illnesses associated with obesity and metabolic syndrome. Diabetes. Yeah, Diabetes alone. Mm. Um, I think didn't your interview with Ted just recently oh, yeah. talk 200 some odd billion and it's going to a half trillion. Um, there are enormous figures, yeah, they, the figures vary, but if you look across the West, well, I was going to say the Western world, but now in China, India mm -hmm. is a catastrophe. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, they're, they're just enormous numbers. It, it, and the suffering is incalculable as in, well, as indeed. he said, yeah. Indeed. And, and so what, what is the societal cost of that? Mm. The, you know, the, the just on human lives, not looking at the monetary aspect. Mm. The monetary aspect, of course, is, is breaking healthcare systems and, and government mm. financing. Um, and, and then look at ruminant agriculture and say, mm. okay, what's the negative of ruminant agriculture if, in fact, the butter, meat, and cheese that's produced could play a fundamental role in reversing metabolic syndrome as part of yeah. the diet? But uh, you are talking though they are, they are complex mass balances and, mm. and mm. I guess one of the problems is no one no one wants to do those sums mm. because it's not in the interest of the current narrative mm. and again not to get into conspiracy theories but after forty or fifty years with the same dietary guidelines it's getting very difficult even if the people involved in them did wake up and realized lower carb and higher fat would be healthier and, mm. and we could reverse metabolic syndrome and all that stuff, even if they realized it, they're stuck in a pickle mm. because how do you start admitting you've been misdirected people for 40 years, whether mm. through ignorance or... Mm. that's So the dietary guidelines, if we return to those, mm. they've stayed the same really now for around 40 years. Mm -hmm. And this year they're slightly changing, but to be honest, it's trivial change, isn't it? Yeah. And I think mostly the change has been the press, not what's actually printed in the documents. Right. Um, and, and one aha moment I had recently is this idea that the dietary guidelines were always couched in language like, if you eat this way, you will avoid. Yes, right. so, preventative. So, exactly. Mm. Eat this way and you're less likely to be obese and you're less likely to get these killer diseases that they mm. were talking about being in the grips of some epidemic of these at the time. Mm. The data now 40 years later shows that they've gotten worse, mm. but 
rather than engage in the argument about whether those dietary guidelines produced the results mm. that we're seeing now, clearly they didn't prevent them, <laughs> but, sure. but they were never intended as a way that someone who is sick should eat. Mm. And I think that today we know enough from a large number of studies that if you find yourself having, and then we can list the, the, yeah. the, the five things of metabolic syndrome. Do you have abdominal obesity? Do you have uh, elevated fasting glucose? Do you mm, have right. elevated triglycerides? Do you have depressed HDL cholesterol? Do you have elevated blood pressure? Three out of those five, you mm. qualify as having metabolic syndrome per some expert panel. Mm. Um, my question would then be, what if you only have two? <laughs> what if you only have one? Um, what, and, and what we know from the research is that this dietary approach for most people in that condition will have a more profound effect in improving mm. those parameters. And in a shockingly short time, as we mm -hmm. know as well, literally within, within days and weeks, those markers will shift. Mm -hmm. It's extraordinary. Uh, to a degree not possible with medications. Uh, absolutely, yeah. And the other thing is the prevalence. I mean, I mentioned in one of my talks, recently it was acknowledged, I forget who came out with the report, but 52% mm. of adult Americans are pre-diabetic. Or diabetic mm. or pre-diabetic. Diabetic yeah. or pre-diabetic. Yeah. Essentially, metabolic syndrome, and it's probably it's higher because mm. their criteria are quite relaxed. Yeah. So, if more than half of your population has a dysfunction that will benefit hugely by lowering the carbohydrate, mm -hmm. and yet our dietary guidelines keep telling everyone to keep eating that carb up to mm -hmm. sixty percent, that's kind of insanity. Absolutely, but they must all be. They're living in a dream world. Mm. They don't see this. Yeah, I was, I, uh, for many talks, I used a slide that said by 2020, mm. the CDC was projecting, and I think this was a 2011 projection, mm. they were projecting that by 2020, half of all adult Americans would be diabetic or pre-diabetic. And then last September was the study that, mm. that came out and said, well, it's already 52%. Right, so, so what you're saying, Peter, is they're ahead of target. Yeah, oh yeah. That's yes. good, right? Yeah, they should get a reward of some kind. Um, a bonus. But, but it, it, indeed, mm. so now we've kind of reached this stage where I think people should be encouraged mm. to look beyond, you know, if you find yourself in that kind of condition, what does that mean? What, what are the consequences of that condition? Mm. And, and you've already alluded to cancer, and we could add Alzheimer's, and All there's a these. large uh, number of chronic illnesses. One mm. could, um, your, your interview with Dr. Kraft pointing to how much greater it's likely to be than 50% uh, of the population yeah. being hyperinsulinemic. Yeah. And, and so, this idea of how are we going to feed the population, um, we really haven't begun to utilize this resource mm -hmm. to the degree that they have in some countries mm -hmm. uh, that are much more pastoral, agricultural based. Uh, but even with cropping systems, uh, you have livestock, ruminant livestock, mm -hmm. integrated into those. If I grow a crop of corn, for example, we could argue about whether we should or not, but if I grow a crop of corn, mm. the grain itself isn't the only thing that's produced. There's a lot of other, we call it stover, or other plant material that's left. That can mm. be grazed by animals. Yes. Uh, and, and there's now a growing movement to, I uh, should pardon the expression, growing movement, to uh, have a green plant growing on soil for the maximum time during the year. Not just the crop, mm. but we're now talking about cover cropping. Uh, Having something else on the soil to protect it. Stop erosion. To stop depletion, erosion, yeah. to, to, to prevent the breakdown of the organic compounds that hold mm. soil structure together to allow more water infiltration to prevent runoff to capture nutrients from the soil to prevent them leaching. 
Mm. Uh, well, those crops are all something that can be grazed by animals. And, and I wonder, not only graze, but large areas with animals, ruminants moving around that you have made green mm -hmm. to keep the soil and topsoil healthier and stop erosion, by having large numbers of ruminants moving around them, um, their feces or whatever will will make the, the hot topsoil even healthier. Mm, mm, mm. There'd be kind of this virtuous circle. Isn't that the fundamental concept that the, lar the grazing animals 10 millennia ago kept rotating the land and keeping it healthy? Mm. So it just seems kind of perfect. It, it, <laughs> it is. Um, I, I love working in the area. I, um, excited about what I call the ruminant revolution, ah, yes. um, which uh, to hearken back to Professor Borlaug's work that, as was said, he's, he saved a billion people from starvation. Hmm. Um, well, the Green Revolution was successful in terms of survival, hmm. but the challenge ahead of us is about prosperity. Mm. And and it seems to me that there are these two basic philosophies. One is to maximize human flourishing, and the competing philosophy is about minimizing human impact. Mm. And I would argue that if you start with those two pl fundamental philosophies, um, you will not be able to get to human flourishing by minimizing human impact. Mm -hmm. You can get to minimizing impact by maximizing human flourishing, because it's only prosperous societies that will be able to afford conservation and worrying about things like that. And by doing that, we know that we will bring down birth rate. We know that we will improve the environment and the, the virtuous circle, as you mentioned, is that <clears throat> by improving the management, we actually have to be managing less land to produce food. Right. And, and so, again, our impact is lessened in that way. Yeah. But if we start by saying, well, we, you know, everything has to be focused through this, let's minimize impact, then somebody somebody takes it, in, mm. you know, gets slighted in, in the conversation. And this way danger lies, because then mm. we get into various decisions that are like someone saying what a healthy diet is. And mm. we meant well, but we just couldn't imagine that there would be any negative consequences. And in mm. fact, if you go back and look in the records um, of Senate Senator McGovern's subcommittee oh, conversations, yeah. there were people saying, we have data that suggests that this could be harmful. Mm. Now, they were talking as scientists, so they weren't making firm conclusions about their data. Mm. They were up against people that didn't have those qualms, and so they made very confident statements about the benefits of eating a low-fat diet, a plant-based diet, mm. and how this would lower all the incidence of these killer diseases. And McGovern and others couldn't imagine that there would be any downside. Mm. They could only see a positive. It's a danger most humans mm. can fall into. It is, but I, I, I often mention that politicians, you can criticize them or whatever, and it's, it's popular to criticize them, but I think it's fair to say that in terms of technical uh, aptitude, uh, politicians as a group are, are not going to be very blessed in that. I mean, it's a very different quality or talent that brings you to being a high-level politician. Mm -hmm. It certainly ain't technical talent, mm -hmm. you know, because it's that's a, different a completely skill set. different skill set. Uh, so unfortunately, politicians, by definition, as a group, are least able to make good, intuitive technical decisions mm -hmm. or think of unintended consequences or balance all mm -hmm. of those mm -hmm. things that you referred to earlier, like ins and outs and logic. Um, and that's, that's just the way it is. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so uh, I guess we are where we are. The dietary guidelines have been driven somewhat to do with this concept of eating vegetables being better, better for the planet, mm -hmm. 
-hmm. The low fat disaster, of course, was one of the real big driving force, and we know that that was a huge mistake. Mm -hmm. Even the Joslin Diabetes Center, which is quite or orthodox, has been around a long time, their leader a couple of years ago said it, it's clear we made an enormous mistake in mm -hmm. recommending 50 or 60 percent carbohydrates in the human diet. Mm -hmm. And if we wish to reverse the epidemics of di diabetes and obesity, we have to greatly reduce carbohydrate. Now, I think he said 40 percent or lower. Mm. We know it's probably lower still. Mm. But even established outfits like Joslin Diabetes Center are saying this. But our officials have just come out with dietary guidelines that hardly changed at all. Mm -hmm. And in, in this most recent r round, hmm. they were very close to justifying their position based on sustainability. That was a very dangerous note I, I had hmm. seen that I didn't realize before, that they were actually dietary guidelines for health. They're bringing in sustainability in the back door. Mm -hmm and openly, and there's been a lot of debate around that. Mm -hmm. Sustainability is very important, but two things. A, they don't understand it, mm -hmm. you know, and B, it, it should be somewhat separate. Oh, it's completely outside of their health. expertise. Utterly. Yes. Yeah. And, and, you know, maybe once they succeed in discharging their, you know, constituted role, mm. and we could argue about how well they've done that, then they might engage other expertise that could discuss sustainability in, in, mm. a, in a truthful way. But it's, it's become this sort of circular reasoning that uh, dietary guidelines came into being in part out of the environmental movement of the 60s and 70s. Mm. And in fact, a very uh, influential vegetarian cookbook, Diet for a Small Planet, that was released mm. in the early 70s is cited in the dietary goals for the United States, which was the Senate report. Right, way back, or, or the well, early in 77. Days. Oh, okay, the originals. Yeah. So, so they cite this cookbook which is fundamentally flawed in many of its statements, but basically it was saying the only way we can feed the planet is by eating vegetarian, et cetera. Mm. So, so this was used as justification at the beginning, but of course the, the, the full impetus of the dietary goals and guidelines was about avoiding these killer diseases. Well, in the fullness of time, we see less and less data that would support that position, so now we're gonna flip around and say, well, it should be for sustainability slash environmental reasons. Mm. And, and so we're, we're getting close to this kind of run around in a circle reasoning. Yeah, it is crazy. And of course the smoking, the huge prevalence of smoking back then was a large part of the, the heart disease rates and, and, and other mm. issues. And then as the dietary guidelines came in, the smoking almost simultaneously was beginning to fall. Mm -hmm. So the huge drop in smoking from 45%, I think, down mm -hmm. to around 20, mm -hmm. is in the exact period that obesity and diabe diabetes has risen. Mm -hmm. So it's nearly worse than simply the dietary guidelines have left us where we are. They've also blown away the benefit, the huge benefit of, of smoking having dropped. They've yeah. blown away that. Mm -hmm. and, and we're even worse now. Yes. So it's, yes. it's shocking really when you think about it in that sense. Yeah. And, and mm. we, there was data presented to the, the oh. Senate subcommittee that there showed, was. Um, you know, you're, you're blaming this current condition mm. on eating animal fat and your own data shows that we're eating less animal fat. And this is back in the 50s and the 60s. We had mm. seen a decline in the consumption of things like lard and tallow. And the, the already in already the 60s it had tailed off, it, and now it's come down yeah. considerably what, over. What we had know. seen over that time was an increase in the consumption of, of vegetable oils. Ah, yeah, huge. Yeah. If you look at the graph for vegetable oils, mm -hmm. I mean, the natural fats were falling, and they fell from the 70s right through to today. Mm -hmm. But, I mean, it's a gentle fall off, but significant. But vegetable oils from the start of the century and through the 70s have, have it's just stunning, mm -hmm. the, the higher amounts of these processed industrial oils extracted from seeds that humans never really had access mm -hmm. to. Exactly. So, cherchez la femme, I mean, <laughs> for our issues. It, it, it is interesting to, yeah. to look at how locked in they were on a theory 
mm. that they would ignore their own data that showed that didn't agree with their story. Well, the belief system was so rooted that vegetable oils were healthy, mm -hmm. vegetable oils, mm. um, I don't think they would ever countenance that, that they could be a problem. Mm -hmm. They had their fall guy, mm -hmm. uh, they had their suspect, um, as far as they were concerned there was blood all over his hands, right. you know, yeah. and the vegetable oils were the police really mm -hmm. <laughs> that helped implicate him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was, it was a stitch up. Mm -hmm. So it's going to take, Peter, I guess, I'm guessing around 10 years more for any hope of this situation to turn around because everyone's invested in it. Mm. All the politicians, all our experts, all our medical profession, the industry of food and the industry of pharma actually benefit massively from, from the problems mm. of health. Mm. Everyone's invested in keeping it the way it is. Mm -hmm. The only sufferer are the people are suffering health wise and of course our tax and our, you know, our taxes are being paid going down a hole mm -hmm. to fund all of this crap. Mm -hmm. But everyone of influence is benefiting to keep it the way it is. Mm. That's going to be hard to change, right? Uh, indeed. It's <laughs> ish. Yeah, give me something <laughs> easy. Um, but on the other side, um, mm. if one could look at it, maybe, mm. maybe I'm just an optimist. Um, but this is something, as you mentioned earlier, these are these are long-standing conditions that people live with mm. and when they get the right information uh, their yes. liberation occurs so quickly and it's so dramatic mm. that people around them start saying what are you doing yes uh, that's uh, happening now exactly. all over the world and and so to a certain degree yes people may resist um, and we're, we're seeing evidence of that. We've seen that over the last 40 years. People would, you know, Dr. Atkins would talk about, or Dr. Eads would, the Eads would talk about, and, and people would oh, yeah. come back at them. Um, uh, and, and, you know, for the most part, I think these people probably meant well and were probably convinced that there was really this aspect of harm in mm. the main, but I think that there's still a number of people who knew and and were mm. consciously uh, defending a position that they knew not to be true. Yeah, um, there were certainly, I would say, a certain amount of those. Yeah, mm. but but I I think that um, we can imagine ways to um, get past the gatekeepers. Mm. Uh, we live in an age now with access to information that we never had before. That's the key. Um, mm. But we also have to, I think, be imaginative about how mm. to extend this information to audiences outside of the current audiences. Yes, because there is the current low carb community and everyone within it thinks that the message is getting out and you see signs in the media, you see articles questioning, you know, the paradigm. But really, the vast majority of people still are clueless. Mm. I mean, most of the public. Mm. But maybe that seed of people who are aware, who've transformed their lives, that's growing, and the information sharing. Mm. You know, at some point, there may be a critical mass. I think you in San Diego referred to a tipping point. Mm -hmm. um, mm. And I, I think so. I, mm. I think that, and again, this would be one of my concerns, mm. um, that you know, the problem isn't the grain-fed cattle, it's the grain-fed people. Yeah. Right? And, it, and if, we, if we make this too elitist, mm. using that term, you, you know, then it puts it automatically out of the reach of a significant part of our population today. Ordinary people who can't afford the fancy grass-fed best beef, yeah. Mm -hmm. And if you, you know, if you can, that's great. Mm. Um, if you can go to your farmer's market, that's great. There are a lot of people who have trouble getting to the market on public transit and then bringing mm. that food to wherever they're living and then preparing it. These are all challenges. Yeah. And I know the challenge of eating on the road, but I also know, you know, I can go into some of these places and get a good slug of animal protein and animal fat for $2, $3. Yeah. Is it ideal? Well, I don't know. I, I, I don't know of data that would let me 
say, well, that's, I, I think that the story of fast food and junk, you know, that, that all, uh, I think we need to deconstruct that as well. Mm. Uh, you know, we talk about processed food, but we don't differentiate between processed animal products and processed plant products. And the no. two of them are very different. And, and the problem with processed meats isn't what's in them, it's what we serve them on or with that's the problem. Mm. And, and it's hopelessly confounded because junk food, yeah, there's a lot of different bad elements in there. And the practices mm. as well of the convenience of access to them mm. and the savory nature, it, it's, it, it's a mishmash that if it's all taken together, it's gonna promote obesity, it's gonna promote mm. ill health. If you actually extract out very specific elements and just take mm -hmm. those, you know, it may not be that bad occasionally yeah. at all. Yeah. I mean, we can talk to Eric mm -hmm. Westman who talks about, uh, you yeah, know, the three, done. you know, the McDonald's diet, the, the client that, that he had who is going and buying, I don't know, two double, you know, burgers with mm. cheese, no bun, no fries, no sugar water. Yeah. And he gets well. And Relative to what he was eating normally, at least, yeah. Well, mm. exactly, and, mm, and so, so, so a lot of our conversation, I think, over time has been infected with this idea because we're going to blame the beef patty, right? Yeah. Not the potatoes fried in vegetable oil, not the sugar water, not the mm. three slices of bread or the special sauce that comes with the two patties. It's all the beef's mm. fault. And the bone, again, yeah. not just refined carb of the worst sort, but also full of vegetable oil as well. I mean, mm. the mm. amount of junk that's in the junk food outside of the patty mm -hmm. is enormous. Now, the patty's probably a fillers as well, put into them a bit of carb grain, I, I don't know. Mm. But, but yeah. maybe not, yeah. depending on where you go, yeah, yeah. very good. And, so, and, and mm. uh, Adele Height talks about, uh, a, in her experience in a, a diabetes clinic, Mm. Um, you know, uh, somebody going to the all-you-can-eat pizza buffet and mm. scraping the toppings off and eating that and leaving the bread and getting well. Y y now, so I think mm. we need to be a, a, a little bit yeah. circumspect in, in some of our attitudes about what constitutes good food versus bad food, um, especially when we start talking you know, to people where going to something like that is an economic possibility for them. True, yeah, we can't be that arrogant that you should only be eating the finest, purest, best produced, ideal foods, mm. because for many, many people that's not going to be an option. Mm -hmm. So if people who had very little money and, and were dependent on, on junk food or, or felt that they were, they were drawn to it, mm -hmm. They only have to make small changes, and I've done it myself, actually. I'd be, mm. I'd be quite open about it. I get double cheeseburgers, and I throw away the buns, and I eat them, and occasionally, not very often, but, but I do. And I know by doing that, I've absolutely minimized the negative um, to mm -hmm. the point of where it's actually probably okay occasionally, no problem. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, so it's a very, mm -hmm. yeah, it's a very good point. And of course, there are things as well, like organ meats are extremely inexpensive. Mm -hmm. uh, in Ireland, actually, you can buy high fat mince uh, and it's much cheaper than the premium but the premium mm. is simply leaner to mm. be honest I'd avoid the premium because it's way too much muscle meat mm -hmm. it's very low fat it's all protein and, and muscle meat mm. and it's not something I'd, I'd want to eat so you call that mince oh mince m-i-n-c-e you you call it ground beef yes ground beef <laughs> yes yeah, that's true we need English translators here yeah, yeah well ground beef but yeah. but the ground beef Irish as it happens grass-fed mm -hmm. high fat is kind of called it the non-premium and ah. it can be less than half the price Oh. of the fat removed. So would that be like 20% fat, 80% lean? Around, I think 18 or 20 is the percentage fat. Mm -hmm. I forget what the premium is, but it's the same material. or something, yeah. It could be less than 10 even, it could be six or eight. Um, mm -hmm. So the healthier one to me is actually the one that's less than half the price. Mm -hmm. It's four euro per kilo instead of 10. Mm -hmm. So it, there's another example of people who don't have as much means mm. can get fresh, good product, actually very cheap, because the belief system is the lean yes. ground beef is, is better. Sure. So it's another example. But here, uh, I know we got to wrap up shortly. Mm. Um, any final thoughts on this whole thing? I guess 
we reckon the internet age, the information age, the growing number of people who are, as you say, transforming their health and then they become quite vocal advocates, mm -hmm. there's going to be a tipping point and the media is, is beginning to acknowledge some realities. We've seen recently in the New York Times there's mm. been articles on the sugar bribery, mm -hmm. on the kind of how, well what we're talking about basically, they've begun to do articles exposing this. Mm -hmm. Sarah, um, oh, named Dr. Sarah Halberg, oh, yeah. had an article just the other day discussing some of this carbohydrate mess mm -hmm. in the New York Times. Mm -hmm. So. It's, it's switching, a few more yeah. years maybe. Yeah. And, and, mm. and I think that um, the, the industries that I work with mm. um, are large numbers of individuals, I mean at the producer level. Mm. Their products then go into industry, if, if you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but we're, we're talking about large numbers of, for the vast majority, family operations. Uh, right, despite okay. the, the the public perception, these are people who deserve to get the information that we've been talking about that you are are making available by talking to so many people, mm. so many experts in the health or researchers, or, you know, doing that mm. kind of good work. And my hope is that we can get those two groups of people speaking with each other uh, to learn connected. from each other. Yes. Um, because I think that will help extend, you know, and maybe make this, pardon the expression, a grassroots movement yeah, of, of sure. um, helping people reclaim health, uh, mm. helping them with their communities um, and, and bridge some of these divides that currently exist in this country and around the world. Mm -hmm. uh, and then again, this this challenge that we have coming at us that in in thirty four years, I guess um, twenty fifty, we're talking about two billion more people in the earth and and needing mm -hmm. to double food production by a hundred per you know double food production mm -hmm. uh, increase by a hundred percent or increase animal products by sixty percent um, right. because these people who are the the, the societies around the world not just growing in population but growing in affluence mm -hmm. and as the their level of, of prosperity increases they want animal products mm. and, and they want the health that they can bring exactly then, yeah and the good exactly. health and productivity and this reduce this huge burden on, on the mm -hmm. system of mm -hmm. all of this this dreadful health issues mm -hmm. from plant-based propaganda Oh, yeah. there I said it. Well, you know, it can be <laughs> plant-based. We'll just run it through a ruminant first. Just, yeah, just, yeah. that's good processing. Absolutely. That's the kind of processed food you really want. Absolutely. Well, hey, thanks a lot, Peter. Delightful talking to you. Likewise, catch thank up you. Again. Cheers.